I'm going to talk today about antimicrobial resistance and about examples of uh, antimicrobial resistance and spread uh, in the world and also in Germany itself. Um, this is the institution at which I work on the second floor of this building. Um, and antimicrobial resistance as a one health paradigm. Uh, I put this slide up here to illustrate the different facets of uh, antimicrobial resistance. Uh, some nostalgic information up here. Antibiotic resistance is one of the most pressing public health issues facing the world today. And as you can see, the problem is, uh, is not only one of uh, it's a global problem, it's not only one of the health system, but it's also caused by the problem of, and the rise of antibiotic resistance is caused by the improper use of antibiotics. And also we have this additional aspect of uh, antibiotics not only being used in human medicine, but also in veterinary sciences. And uh, so in, in, in Germany there, 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 is, there are now programs uh, primarily propagated uh, by the, 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 the Chancellor uh, on, de on dealing uh, with the problem of antibiotic resistance in a One Health concept. And the most chilling statement is out here. These are the numbers predicted from a, a report on the number of people who would succumb to infections uh, due to uh, the rise of antimicrobial resistance. I don't know if you can see these numbers here very well, uh, but it's projected to be higher than living cancer by 2050. But these are very, very crude uh, predictions at the moment. Still, the problem is this, and this is the chilling fact. The post-antibiotic era means that, in effect, an end to the modern medicine as we know it. Things as common as a strep throat or a child's scratch knee could once again uh, kill. Now, it's amazing when you consider the fact that uh, antibiotic, uh, antimicrobial therapy was only introduced just over 70 years ago, and we've gone full circle uh, from antimicrobial therapy to antimicrobial uh, resistance here. So even before uh, penicillin was introduced as a drug, it was already, already resistance. And as you can see, uh, following uh, the rise of uh, multi-resistance Staphylococcus aureus, uh, issuance of uh, an, 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 a document for combating antibiotic resistance in 1991 already by the WHO, uh, which has hardly had any, any effect. Uh, and we've gone on uh, to more or less now to reach an age where we have, we're probably at a, a very close to a post-antibiotic age if we don't do something about this. Uh, and of course the uh, literature and, and, and the reports are full of a complete drug resistance uh, bacteria, in this case uh, microbacteria tuberculosis. So um, all this is very well known and, and documented and this is a, 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 a cartoon taken from a recent uh, a review in, in, in science. Um, and as you can see, that uh, before the introduction of penicillin, it was already suspected that re resistance was already uh, known. And every single antibody that has been released, uh, some newer ones here like linisolid, uh, a few months after the introduction, there's already been uh, resistance. But uh, studying antibody resistance, this is really uh, the problem. So what we have here is a, uh, a, a genetic element that carries 46 different antibiotic resistance and antimicrobial resistance genes, so one transferable element. So it's not the case of a single uh, resistance, but the case that multiple resistance are being organized together. And this is, these are the principles that we don't understand. How do these elements uh, come together? This is from Acetinobacter baumani, an 86 mega a resistance island, and as, as, as I've written up here, a genetic document of history of mankind's chemical intervention of infectious diseases, arsenic resistance genes, mercury resistance genes, every single antibiotic that we've thrown at bacteria, uh, the resistance mechanisms are already present on such an element. So as these elements move around, and uh, we don't understand how they are formed and how, how they, uh, what kind of selection pressures move these uh, elements around, we don't only have the, the advent of individual resistance, but also cross resistance and, and antimicrobial resistance. By the way, these, uh, this element also carries uh, resistance to a number of detergents. And of course, antibiotic resistance is, is ancient, and this is uh, um, uh, um, taken out of a manuscript. It was recently published in Science. 
And we now know that present-day environments and, and the human genomes have much larger concentrations in the microbiomes, antibiotic resistance genes that we previously suspected. And it's known from, and from this study uh, from a 30,000-year-old Beringia permafrost sediments. It's already known, it was, and it was shown in this study, that uh, genes for beta-lactams, tetracyclines, glycopeptide antibiotics like vancomycin were already present. So it, this is not a new, uh, this is not a new phenomenon, and these uh, uh, antibiotics would probably uh, produce uh, to enable survival of bacteria and to com compete in, in, in difficult environments. Of course, driving antibiotic use or misuse is the consumption and from a study here published by uh, Dr. Ramana, 36% um, increase of uh, consumption of antibiotic between 2000 and 2010, the increased consumption of carbapenems, uh, 45%. Uh, now, most of this increase is not, not taking place here in Europe, uh, and, or here, no, here in the United States and in Europe, but in countries that are uh, de developing and, and, and progressing at tremendous rates. And of course, there is a problem. The antimicrobial resistance is also a pro one world problem because of uh, travel uh, and the, the speed at which we travel from uh, the exchange of goods and the exchange of, of, uh, of uh, uh, food and, and export of food uh, throughout the world. Um, here, a small study taken from uh, students in Sweden before and after travel to Africa or to the Indian uh, subcontinent. It's not important to know what all these genes are, but it, it just tells you that before and after there's a significant uh, difference. And so uh, travel to a country or to another country can significantly also affect uh, the, the, your microbiota and the kinds of genes that you bring back in, in terms of resistance. Now, in Europe, of course, the, the European Center for Disease Control produces maps, these kinds of maps uh, telling us about the the incidence or, or the prevalence of different types of uh, resistant infections uh, throughout Europe. As you will clearly see, there seems to be a north-south um, a balance in, uh, uh, in here. And uh, with time, countries uh, and many countries, including Germany, are developing resistance to, to uh, third-generation uh, cephalosporins or bacteria develop, developing resistance to third-generation cephalosporins, as well as uh, carbapenems. So the scenario that is feared here is that we have a multi-drug resistance that we already cannot treat uh, uh, because it's producing cephalosporins, and then you have only carbapenems, and then uh, these uh, you treat them with carbapenems, and then you only and, and then they acquire resistance, and then you you are basically left with a very old drug like cholestin to treat these uh, uh, infections, and if they become resistant to cholestin, then there's nothing else left. So uh, this, this is, of course, the scenario that is, is, is feared. We'll come back to this right at the end. Now, in, in Germany, in 2010, we started a study. Uh, and, and this study was directed at not only looking at uh, resistant, uh, bacteria, resistant bacteria from human populations, but also from companion animals, from livestock companion animals, from food, from wild um, uh, animals, uh, as well as some, some isolates from the environment. Uh, this was a, a relatively big study, and, and, and one of the most important parts, the thing of this study was to bring together clinicians as well as veterinarians to agree on standard typings uh, to do, uh, for example, antimicrobial resistance. And it's done very differently in, uh, in, in medical sciences or as compared to veterinarians. And, and people, there is, there is a saying that uh, they would rather exchange their toothbrushes then exchange the protocols for harmonization. So this was a, a major e effort to, to, to get uh, data together. But one of the early conclusions was, of course, that bacterial isolates are of similar uh, resistances are present in animals and in humans. So the question is, how, what is similar? And how related are these isolates, really? So we embarked on whole genome sequencing to obtain uh, molecular fingerprints uh, of, on all of these bacteria in these different environments. To do this, we needed to, to, to do some high throughput analysis, and just, I'm just putting up this slide uh, here. We developed, we developed this uh, platform for annotation and analysis, 
uh, and it gives us different kinds of information. So the sequence goes in there, and you can pick out here, for example, plasmid and phages, or antibiotic resistance genes, virulence genes. It allows you to do epidemiology, do some visualization on a geographical scale, as well as look at relatedness. Uh, and the point of this slide here is really that the analysis allows uh, it, it allows the analysis of about 1,000 genomes every 12 hours. So using this uh, platform, we now look, we, we have up to now collected uh, nearly 6,000 isolates, of which 2,404 have been uh, sequenced, and we've concentrated on mainly these enzymes, CTX uh, enzymes, uh, which are the most uh, prevalent enzymes uh, mediating uh, resistance uh, to beta lactams. And this is a, a, a visualization of the isolates that we sequenced uh, throughout Germany. You can already see that some isolates predominant in certain areas of Germany as compared to others, but this picture might change the more we sequence uh, these things. We also see clusters of isolates coming up here that are highly uh, related. So the rest of my talk is going to be on focusing on one uh, particular resistance uh, allele, the CTXM15, uh, because these enzymes are pandemic and there are over 150 variants known, and we're only going to look at one, one of these variants here. So uh, we want you to trace pen compartment same So we want you to know those isolates that were common and, and, and identical, if you wish, in these different compartments that we're looking at. So we first concentrated on, on a sequence type of E. coli called 131. Um, it's a pandemic uh, clone. It's, uh, there are millions and millions of cases of isolation of this uh, SD131 clone all over the world. 40 to 80 percent of all uh, CTX, uh, bacteria produced CTXM, are uh, actually this one SD131. It ex has extremely successful subclades. Um, and so we, were expect we expected also that in our uh, analysis that we would find um, SD131. As, as a major, major clone, but also as a clone is possibly present in all these different environments. Um, we supplemented the study also by uh, performing a study looking at a, at a, 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 a university U board of urology uh, by isolating and sequencing every single isolate that we could get in a period of six months. And as you can see here, this ST131 forms about 20% of all, all the isolates. And in fact, it's, uh, the, uh, the first uh, seven uh, ST uh, sequence types uh, com uh, form over 50% of all the infections caused uh, in, in, in the ward. Um, this is the ST131. This is a, a re representation of the core genome. Now, we always talk about genome comparisons, but really what we're talking about is we, are, we never sequence genomes to completion, and these are all uh, uh, so-called gapped genomes, and we're using the common information to create then taxonomic uh, uh, representations. So as you can see in here, uh, just concentrate on the colors uh, in here, in SC131, you not only have uh, resistant, those producing these ESBL enzymes, the beta lactam, extended beta lactamases, but also clearly isolates that are not resistant, that in fact do not carry any resistance at all. So we put together all this information, and, and what we've uh, subsequently done is that uh, we've tried to try and understand the evolution of this SD131, which is extremely uh, successful worldwide. Now, we're not the only ones uh, uh, to, uh, to do this, but to produce uh, this picture, we completely sequenced the genomes of 30 uh, isolates and extended this analysis then also to further 260 isolates. Um, to cut a long story short on, on all of this, uh, the, the original plant, the original strain already contained different plasmids, so these plasmids were endogenous uh, to, the, uh, to, to, this, to the strain and were part of the success of the strain. I don't have the time to go into this, but they carry also pieces of chromosomal DNA that are extremely important for the metabolism. And then with the introduction of, of fluoroquinolones and the uh, acquisition of mutations in gyres and the Parsi locus, uh, you had a tremendous expansion of this clone. And uh, in, in, before 1990, we had a, cl a, a clay called B, which was very dominant. And since uh, around after the 1990s, from 2000 onwards, we have only a subclade of the original strain, ST1131. 131, 
uh, trade sea, uh, which is uh, virtually isolated all over the world. And more recent data suggests there is a new trade with a, new, a, a different combination of the enzyme that's emerging also worldwide. Um, this slide is just to show you that these uh, genomes that we sequence here, they all don't have the same size. It's the reason is because they carry different numbers of prophages, insertion elements, and also so-called pathogenity or genomic uh, islands. Uh, they have highly conserved uh, plasmids, and, mu and may much of the uh, antibiotic resistance genes on plasmids uh, that are actually not conserved. So this. Uh, the introduction of the antibiotic resistance genes is mainly on plasmids which were not endogenous uh, to the uh, SD131. Um, along, uh, 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 the important point of this slide is here that these genomes are highly uh, synthetic, highly homologous, they have different genome content, um, and the lineage C that is emerging now has picked up a, a particular pathogenesis island. Uh, which uh, makes it extremely uh, successful. And on this slide, this, this island is now described in a little bit in detail. So it con con carries a, a restriction modification system. It uh, encodes genes for the uptake of uh, ferric disitrate, an alternative uh, uh, holy transporter protein for osmotic rep uh, adaptation, uh, a heat resistance cluster, a cluster of genes that will uh, allow adaptation to heat, and also, very interestingly, uh, a system for taking up oxidized sugars. So uh, being able to take up these kinds of sugars in the gut uh, gives you a clear advantage over other bacteria that are not able to use these as substrates. So having done all that work, we, 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 we then looked at our data and found that ST131 is only virtually only present in humans and occasionally in companion animals. So it's not the pan clone that we were looking for. Um, and as we go down uh, the slide and look at the different sequence types that were isolated from all these different compartments, we find that actually there is one clone called ST410, which is present in all these different uh, compartments. It's also interesting to note that, for example, some of these isolates uh, do not are present only in food and in, in, in animal isolates, but are not associated with human uh, infections. So we looked at this. ST410, all these uh, isolates more closely, and it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a very interesting uh, group of bacteria. They are very highly related, uh, regardless of, of the, whether they are isolated from humans or from, from animals. You can see the genomes, which have only 5 million base pairs, are only different in 75 different uh, uh, positions. So these are highly conserved uh, uh, strains. And uh, many of them carry the resistance gene actually on the chromosome. So these are clonally uh, uh, spread. Um, we think that this clone is adjusting itself. Uh, we, it's not clear to us to which environment, but it, obviously there are a bunch of different clones uh, that um, are present in identical forms, both in human as well, animal as well as in the environment. This is a little more data on more isolates uh, that we have. So we can say that 400, SC410 and isolates are highly uh, related to one another, uh, but uh, the ones that carry these different LEs of resistance are, are quite distinct, and they represent about 5% of the population of all clinical isolates uh, that we have from Germany, but also from data emerging in Denmark. I want to turn uh, to polystyrene resistance because this is something that uh, has had a lot of it, uh, generated a lot of interest in the last uh, uh, few uh, few months. Um, was, it's a very old antibiotic but was uh, actually rejected because it, you can basically see it as a poison, a toxic, a tox, a toxic uh, 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 pharmaceutical. Uh, but it's been reintroduced because of the, re because of the uh, emergence of multi-resistant uh, clones. Uh, Generally, collagen resistance is either intrinsic or acquired, but uh, since last year, a plasmid with uh, a resistance gene has been described uh, that, that uh, causes modification of the LPS. So this collagen resistance, resistance gene called MCR1 is plasmid-born. It was first detected in China. There are now a number of variants uh, known, 
and it seems to be more prevalent in, in livestock than in humans. And uh, by the last count, it's uh, spread all over the world. And there are very, very few countries that do not have this MCR1 gene. The question is, where, where, where and how has it emerged? So we looked at the, the isolates that we have, in, uh, the, the, uh, the isolates that we sequence. We looked for the presence of the MCR1 uh, gene. Now remember, these are already bacteria that are resistant to third generation cephalosporins. So in about 6.5% of all isolates for food, uh, this, uh, carry this, uh, this gene. Uh, livestock isolates about 3%, and in humans it's about 1%. And it's interesting to compare uh, the MCR1, uh, the, the, the isolate, the population structure of MCR1 in Germany and in Spain. It's interesting because in, in China it's used as a promoter, growth promoter in livestock, also therapeutically used, but it's forbidden. Uh, and it's not used in humans. In Europe, it's basically the other way around. And despite this, in both regions of the world, the uh, percentage of uh, resistant isolates uh, is around 1%. So all despite huge use uh, in, uh, in, in livestock as a growth hormone in China, it doesn't seem to be puzzling. This hasn't created a bigger problem than it would be. Now what's interesting is also when you look at the sequence types of bacteria carrying uh, the MCR1 gene, and these are from China, Spain, and Germany, uh, you see in, in China there are many, many diverse, so it's not, it's, it's, long, it's not clonal, it's spread and present in very many different bacteria, but you can see already the major clone that I talked to you about is uh, uh, already uh, harbors uh, MCR1, so there are individual clones that harbor these resistance genes. Um, even in looking at the population structure of MCR1 in a single country, you can see there's very little overlap. So this it seems to be a highly a promiscuous plasma that is capable of spread in many, many different environments. Now, uh, this is, we think, the tip of, tip of the iceberg because uh, in, in the study that I described earlier on where we sequence consecutive isolates from a, a, a uro board of urology, uh, one of 168 isolates was carrying MCR1 gene, which was not detected. Um, it was only detected by sequencing because we don't not usually screen for cholesterol resistant. So these are my uh, the, the three epidemiological c uh, scenarios that I've been talking about. S3131 is primarily human; it's spreading from there, radiating out into the environment. MCR1 is, is probably in in the environment. Uh, sorry, in the in livestock and radiating out and spreading into other populations. In the case of 410, we have uh, isolates in every single compartment, so that we're not able to, at this time, uh, say what the directionality of this is. But it tells you a little bit, gives you an idea of the complexity of uh, clones that are emerging. Now, of course, I pointed, I already indicated to you that uh, this is, the, the, the worry is that this is, there's an epidemiological disaster waiting. Um, and with the accumulation of, of carbapenem resistance, then you have only cholesterol resistance, and then you have pen resistance, rather, where there's only very limited uh, treatment options. There are already reports, individual reports of uh, persons uh, or patients uh, uh, with bacteria that cannot be treated with any known antibiotic. And this is exactly what we have also found. So we have found in a single isolate that was isolated in 2014 in Germany. Uh, it is, uh, it is an ESPL, so it's third generation resistant. It contains carbapenem resistant genes, two of them on two different plasmids, a cholesterol resistant gene on a plasmid, and in total these plasmids have 35 different antibiotic resistance genes. So we're almost uh, there. And it's interesting because when you look at that particular strain, it's a, it's a member of a sequence type 362, and we, we were lucky to get sequence, isolate, sequence from isolates they were isolated in 1952 of ST362 and 214. So what it seems to have, to have happened is that um, the, the resistance has been coming in and increasing on plasmids. But interestingly also, when looking at the genome, and these are all completely sequenced genomes, uh, we have virulence genes also being uh, accum accumulating on the chromosome. So uh, there is uh, two trajectories, one on the plasmids for resistance, one on the chromosomes for uh, the genes. Now, this is my final slide. Um, 
I wish to acknowledge all my colleagues who participated in this study and the funding institutions. Thank you very much.